the stories were true. The king is born. The messengers have scattered into the darkest streets. With lamps held high to broadcast the news, the season of mercy has begun. One and all, come and take this gift. God is not counting our sins against us. Receive the Savior, born and died and alive again. His life for yours, your life unending. Christmas is the first line of an invitation, not to be perfect, not to try harder, not to get it right this time but to believe and be counted among those who rest in his hands. We have not come to tell the world to do better. We sing instead of the depth of our sin and of amazing grace that runs deeper still. The stories were true. The mystery is revealed. Mercy for sinners. The Savior is born.
Oh, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the East Side School dancers. Woo. That's a tough act to follow. That's a very tough act to follow. I, I promise you I'm not here to dance. I'm definitely not here to dance. I get the, my pants are a bit too stiff for that. But I'm here <laughs> to definitely just welcome you to this beautiful, beautiful evening. Just to shortly introduce myself, my name is Tabiso Kambule. I'll be doing a little bit of the MC for today and also just making sure that you know what is going on for today, right? Um, okay, so the bathrooms. So as you entered, um, basically as you exit towards my left, that is where the bathrooms are. You'll see that there is a sign there as well showing toilets. Uh, that is Darse. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that is where the bathrooms are. And then, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see on your seats, on your seats, you have what we call connect cards. Right? That's because we want to get to know you. And this is the time that you also are allowed to take out your phone and also scan the QR code. So not only did you take out your phone for Black Friday, you are more than welcome to take it out now as well because we want to get to know you better. We want to connect with you. Please um, uh, make sure that you scan the QR codes and make sure that you do fill in that connect card. And after doing that, please post it for us. You see that there is a red post box all over there. Please do post it for us as we would like to connect with you. Of course, if you want to know more about the church, if you want to know more about the school, if you want to know more about Abbas Pride, and ladies and gentlemen, also if you just want to connect with our pastors. All right. So I love... The fact that you guys participated just now, and we're going to do that a little bit more. Um, I'm going to take you back to about a month when the Boca were playing and the cardiovascular doctors were working over time because they kept on winning by one point to prove a point. I don't know why they did that to us. But I want you guys to get involved. Just like you got involved in front of the TV and you were like, yay, screaming for the box. I want you to get involved tonight. So um, to our beautiful band here that's going to be performing, get involved with them as well. But we're also going to do a bit of scripture reading, ladies and gentlemen. You'll see that it's going to pop up on the screen and everything that is in italics, we're going to ask that you please read with us. So everybody's going to basically be reading all of the scripture that is going to be in italics, uh, please read it all together with us. So then, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, I'm going to call on the children, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, and the angels. So, ladies and gentlemen, kids are going to start us off. Um, I'm going to ask that you... I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. Thank you. So, for the first song, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that we please stay seated, and then we will join them thereafter. Buckle up, have a feel-good time, enjoy. As I said, get involved. We want you to get involved. They love it when you get involved, and just have a good time. Enjoy. Yes, all of the kids can come.
story. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census, do kids know what a census is? It's when they count all the people. The census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place when Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town. They went to register so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the town of? To the town of? The town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married him and was expecting a child. Here we go. And everybody, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Won't you stand with us as we sing together?
living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of God shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. There will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests.
And so the prophecy spoken years before was fulfilled. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Thank you. 
says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. worship this Jesus who, by the way, is no longer in the manger. He's at the Father's right hand. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for becoming a man. We don't know how it all happened, but we thank you, Lord, that you became a man and dwelt among us. Father God, we thank you for, for giving your only son for us. And Holy Spirit, I'm so grateful. <coughs> That, it, um, that at times like this in the year, you come to remind us of, of your amazing love. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, um, <clears throat> we, we so believe in the story of Jesus. You already said, well, this is our 25th year that we exist as a church. And for 25 years, what we've done, starting with a small handful of people, we've given ourselves to telling the story of Jesus again and again. And I just love, I love the carol service. Um, I said to somebody who's new, I said, this is what happens. Eastside is chaos. Because the children are here. <clears throat> I don't think, Jason will speak about it in a minute. I don't think... Um, 
I don't think the stable was a neat little hotel room. Animals were everywhere. It was quite messy. And, um, and I think God wanted us to celebrate like us, just without all of the frills and everything else, to simply enjoy Christmas and know that God loves us. Now, um, we're going to take an offering now. I'm just worried that those of you who are visiting um, feel like you're obligated to give. Um, we, because we so believe in what we do here at Eastside, those who call Eastside their spiritual home, give sacrificially so we can have a carol service like this, holiday clubs and other things. We build this building so we can welcome visitors in um, like many of you are tonight. And so if you're a visitor or, or anyone like that, we don't want you to feel obligated to give. But we do want to give our own people the opportunity to give. So we're going to do that now. We're just going to take up the tithe and offering and then, then Jason is simply going to come and and just share God's word with us. So let, let's pray together. Lord, we, we thank you for Jesus, that you gave, gave Jesus to us, your son. And we're just giving a little bit back now, Lord, to you. And what we have, and I pray, Lord, that as we give, that you stir the, the hope in the hearts of everyone who's here, and that you'd help us, Lord, to use the money to bring hope and salvation to the many people who so desperately need to see the light and feel the hope in a world that is so much darker than it was last year this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you need to give, um, if you want to give, all, um, everything you need to give is up there. Um, thank you.
dad or your, if you're an older person here, your granddad or your, your dad, and the granddad comes and says, this year, we're having a simple Christmas. You can choose one thing that we're going to do for Christmas. One thing. What would it be? What would it be? Right? Now, I'm sure many of you will say, well, we're going to do presents. Right? Can I get an amen? Yeah. Well, when we think about the symbols of Christmas, there's one symbol that actually predates the symbol of Christmas. Like when we think of Christmas, we think of presents. You might think of Santa Claus. You might think of Christmas trees and all that kind of thing. But there's one Christmas symbol that is more ancient than all the others. Can you guys guess what it is? Yeah, Jesus. That's a good answer. Good. Can we just give this guy a round of applause? Jesus. That's awesome. Yeah, Jesus is the reason for Christmas. But the symbol of Christmas that it predates all the others is the symbol of light. The symbol of light. If you think about it, one of the first, like, the first time you realize that Christmas is coming, is just, just picture it. You're walking in the mall in October. It's like mid-October. You're walking, and you see wall, like, mall management busy doing something on the side, and they're busy putting up lights. And all of a sudden, you realize Christmas is coming. <laughs> Why? Because like, Christmas lights just tell us that Christmas is coming. And if you think about it, where we get a lot of our Christmas traditions comes from the Northern Hemisphere. The 25th of December is one of the shortest days in the Northern Hemisphere. It's one of the darkest, and it's one of, like, the coldest. And so you can imagine sitting in one of those towns and seeing lights outside. It, like, brings a a warmth to the Christmas season, a a sense of joy in the midst of the gloom. But we're in South Africa, right? We're in the Southern Hemisphere. December 25th, is one of the longest, one of the hottest. (laughs) Even during a heat wave, you guys are here. Well done, by the way. And it's one of our brightest. Yet even in South Africa, even in Pretoria, one of Pretoria's favorite traditions is what? To jump into a car, to drive to one street, (laughs) and to sit for an ungodly amount of time just to see Christmas lights. Right? Lawley Street. If you haven't done it, you should go do it this year. Just prepare yourself, bring snacks, and go to the bathroom before you get in the car. <laughs> okay? Just <laughs> putting it out there. But Christmas lights tell us Christmas is here. It's, it's part of our tradition. And you might stop and ask, why? Why out of all the traditions are lights one of them that lights symbolize Christmas the most? Well, when we go into the scriptures, we've looked at some of the scriptures tonight, we see that the Christmas story is full of glorious, magnificent light. If you think about the the shepherds um, in Palestine, on Bethlehem's fields, lying, looking after their sheep at nighttime, in the quiet of night, what happens? They get scared out of their pants because a host of angels shining bright in the sky sing glory to Jesus. They sing joy to the world. Jesus has come. The Messiah has come. Can you imagine being one of those shepherds lying in the dark and all of a sudden your eyeballs are bursting with the light? The story that we're going to be reading tonight, Matthew chapter 2, is the story of the Magi who see a light rise in the sky and they begin to follow that light and they find Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The story of Jesus, the story of Christmas is a story of light breaking in to the darkness. Jesus is the light of of life. And I want to read a quote to you from one of my favorite authors. His name is Tim Keller. He says this. He says, Christmas contains many spiritual truths, but it will be hard to grasp all the others unless we grasp this one first. That is, that the world is a dark place. We've all felt that darkness. We've all experienced that darkness in our own lives. And we will never, never find a way or see reality, unless Jesus is our light. We will never see reality unless Jesus is in our light. Now, you and I, we in South Africa, we know what it's like to be without light. Thank you, ESCOM, right? And we become really like, I, I, I think, tenacity is a word that we can describe South Africans with, right? We've got pretty kitted out. In the beginning of load shedding, all those years ago, we were rummaging around for our candles. Some of you guys have candles on your chairs. We're going to use them a little later. Now we kind of kitted out. Thank you to builders for getting those little, like, 200 rand, 300 rand little lights that we can plug into the wall. When the lights go off, we have a light. We don't have to, like, wade around in the darkness trying to find just our cell phone. Some of you have got generators, some of you guys have got inverters, some of you guys have solar panels. God bless you, I wish I was you. (laughs) 
We, we kidded ourselves out. Why? Because we know what it's like to be stuck in the dark. We know what it's like to feel like a little bit hopeless. I don't know, there's nothing worse than waking up in the middle of the night when there's no noise in your house, no light in your house, because suddenly it's load shedding. We know what it's like to be without light for our eyes, but we also know what it's like, if we're honest with ourselves, we take a moment to, to stop and to consider it, what it's like to be without light for our souls. Now the Bible describes darkness as a symbol for chaos, a symbol for evil, a symbol for sin, and, and, and all of us, no matter how, from the youngest to the oldest, we've all been touched by that kind of darkness. We've experienced sickness, we've experienced death, we've experienced the sin of others affecting us and breaking us, and we've experienced our own sin breaking others. We've experienced the chaos of the darkness of this world. And what I love about carol services like this is that it reminds us that there is a light. And that light is Jesus Christ. And today, that's what it's all about. You see, not only do we have a symbol of, of darkness in the Bible de depicting the chaos of evil, but we have the symbol of light depicting God Himself. There's a beautiful verse in John chapter 1 when John is speaking about the coming of Jesus Christ. He says this. He says, In Him was life. We've read this a little bit earlier. And that life was the light of all mankind. Jesus knew he was coming into a dark, broken world, and he was coming to bring light. And that light shines into the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. There's not a battle going on here. The light that Jesus brings to our souls and to the souls of others, the evil and the darkness and the chaos cannot overwhelm it. He is the light of life. And this symbol of God being light it's a symbol going all it's 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 a symbol throughout the scriptures from the start of the bible on the first page of the bible all the way through to the last page of the bible we see Jesus Christ God himself bringing light and life and increase and a new beginning through the the creation of light you know in the beginning genesis chapter 1 if you think about the very first page of the bible it says that it says this it says the world was formless and void and darkness covered the deep and we are told that the Holy Spirit was hovering above the waters. And the very first thing that God said was, Let there be, let there be light. And it was out of that light that God created everything that we know and we can see. He separated the waters from the land. He created the animals. He created the sun and the moon. He created the universe as we know it. And it, was, it all began with light, the new beginnings. And there's this beautiful moment in Genesis chapter 1, that we read about how God creates humanity. He creates you and I in His image, image bearers of His light. And we are told that He forms us out of the dust of the ground. He crafted us. And what did God do? He took His light, He took His life, and He breathed that life into the heart and the soul of humanity. And He said, My light will be your light. My life will be your life. And he said to humanity, he said, go out into the world. Take what I've created to be good and make it better. Make it perfect. He created us to be his image bearers, the light to the world, that everything and everyone would be attracted to, that we would bring peace and life to the world. We just turn the page, one page over, and we see what Adam and Eve did, right? Right? They began to wonder to themselves, what if we can do things in a way that God doesn't say we should do them? God has created us and He told us what is good, but what if we know what is better? What if we can create a light that is better than what God can create? And so they turned to the tree and they took for themselves the knowledge of good and evil. They chose to turn their backs on God and as they turned their backs on God and tried to create something for themselves out of their own that life was gone. What God had breathed into man was now darkness. And in this moment, darkness entered into the heart of all humanity. And you and I know what it's like. We can look at Adam and Eve and we can say, yes, they, they, what was wrong with them, right? We could be living in paradise right now if it wasn't for Adam and Eve. But if we're honest with ourselves, we too choose often to, as we're wading around in the darkness, we think, what if this will give me life? 
What if this will give me hope? What if this time, this thing will actually do for me what the world is telling me it will do for me? And we try again and again to light this, our souls with life and we come out short again and again and again. At least I do. And it is into that story, the story of darkness, that Jesus Christ came into the world to bring life. Jesus Christ came and as the light bearer and he came to bring all who would come to him new life. That is the story of Christmas. That is the reason why you and I still have lights today. Many hundreds of years ago they were doing this and we we're going to be doing it a little bit later. But it's a symbol of life. And light entering into the world. An opportunity for you and I to experience fullness in a way that darkness cannot overcome. So, if you have your Bibles with me, turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking at the story of the Magi. And as we turn there, we're going to have the scripture up on the screen. I've got like a, a cool video that... For those who are more visual learners than audible learners, you can watch the screen with me. But I want, as we're watching it, as you're turning there, I want you to pay attention to two particular things. The first one is this. We often think about the Christmas story being one of just light. We almost think of it like a, like a children's story. But actually, when you start paying attention, you begin to realize that the story that Jesus was born into was not a children's story. This isn't one of like the Disney movies, Right? He was born into the darkness. He was born into the reality of this world. And as we begin to unpack Scripture, we see at this, just the start of the New Testament, we see stories of violence. We see stories of refugees fleeing from their homes, Jesus being one of them. We're going to see that tonight. We see the abuse of power within Jerusalem, political figures, corrupt political figures. That's another thing that we all know about in this world, right? Jesus was born into this darkness. And so as we pay attention to the scripture and you think about the story of Jesus, think about the darkness, how Jesus was born into the darkness. That was the reason he came, to, to shatter darkness's power. And the second thing I want you to pay attention to, because it's really interesting, and I geek out about like cool biblical things, is, is the movement of the star, the magi, who see a star in the sky and go straight to Jerusalem. Why is that? And then this magical, mysterious star moves itself and directs them to Jesus in Bethlehem. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that as, as we finish the scripture. So, let's turn. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. Let's read the word of the Lord together. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. <laughs> There's my mic on, there you go. So, growing up, one of my favorite carols, and we didn't sing it tonight, so I'm going to take it up with my wife, because she organized this, was We Three Kings. You guys know that song? It goes like this. We three kings of Orient are... I don't believe... I can't believe I'm actually singing to you. <laughs> Bearing gifts, we travel so far. Yeah, you guys know that song? Moors and mounds. Yeah, okay, I don't have to go there. Okay. So it was one of my favorite songs, and the reason was very simple. Because in preschool, I got, I got placed as one of the three wise kings two years in a row. Okay? I was pretty impressed with myself as like a four-year-old. I thought I was doing pretty well with life, right? And so that was one of the songs I, I had to learn, because I used to sing it going up on stage. But there is something super interesting that happens in that song and in our tradition. So like, even as we look at this picture, we see three. Three kings, right? That's the picture that we have. And in the song, we're speaking about these three kings that are traveling so far, and they're bringing their myrrh, and their, their frankincense, and their gold, and they're bringing it to Jesus. But what we've just read in Matthew chapter 2 doesn't mention kings. Have you guys ever noticed that before? It doesn't mention kings. It doesn't mention three. So why is it that we have this kind of tradition? Was it some like random guy in the Middle East sitting at a bar and being like, you know what, I need to make up a song here. Like, let me, let, let's choose three kings and let's send them to... You. No, like, that's not what happened. In fact, when we look throughout hi Christian history, if you've ever wondered why do we have this weird tradition of kings, when clearly it speaks about magi, and magi were, were, were people who studied the stars. They were counselors to the kings, and that's why Herod just let them in. There's this beautiful prophecy in Isaiah chapter 60, and it's worth going to read. If you're going to do any kind of um, reading for Christmas, go and read um, Isaiah chapter 60 in light of Matthew chapter 2. I'm, ge I'm geeking out here just a little bit. And what we see in Isaiah chapter 60 is this prophecy about a Messiah who would come. And we're told in the very first line that God was going to shine His light upon Jerusalem. And that light was going to attract people from all over the world. And God was going to bring a renewal in Jerusalem. And he was going to bring new life. Remember that connection of light and newness that we see throughout Scripture. And it says, in Jerusalem, this is, this is so cool. In Jerusalem, kings would come with incense and gold and lay it down in Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 2, we have these People, these magi from afar bringing frankincense and gold, and they see a star in the sky and they believe. You notice it just says they saw a star in the sky and they went straight to Jerusalem. Why? Because they were holding on to a prophecy they'd heard somewhere, somehow. We don't know much about them, but they knew somehow the Isaiah 60 passage. And they went through to Jerusalem and they said, Where is the new Messiah? And King Herod was like, corrupt with power. By the way, King Herod killed many of his family members just because he was worried that they were going to kill him and become king. And King Herod is beginning to be jealous. He's corrupt. He's evil. And he says, oh, yeah, like, let's find this Messiah. Go and read what happens in verse 16 in Bethlehem. Very similar to what's happening today. The kings, or magi, realize that the light of God isn't shining in Jerusalem. And they look back to the stars, and the star moves in the sky, and they begin to follow it. This beautiful, mysterious star moves, and it takes them to where Bethlehem, leading them to Jesus Christ, the Savior who had been born. And it was there that they laid down their gold and their incense, just like the Isaiah prophecy. You see, the light of the world, the city on the hill that could not be hidden, pictured in Isaiah chapter 60, was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, our Savior. One of the most beautiful things about Christianity is that Christianity isn't limited to one city. Christianity and the Spirit of God isn't limited to one space and one time. We don't have to go to Jerusalem to find Jesus Christ. We just have to turn to Christ right now where you are and you can be filled with the light of life. It's unlike any other religion in the world. Every other religion has their space, not Christianity. Why? Because the star moved pointing us to the true light of the world, Jesus Christ, the person himself. 
Jesus Christ became the light of the world. And so as we think about Christmas, simply Christmas, and we think about what Christmas is all about, we had the answer a little bit earlier from this gentleman in the front. It's Jesus. Jesus, the light of the world. And so why do we adorn our trees and our malls and our homes? And why do we get stuck in Lawley Street for hours on end? Because in some way, somehow, in the traditions past, we, would, we saw the light as a symbol of Jesus, bringing hope into the dark spaces. Now, I don't know where you are in your walk with God. I don't know what you have gone through or what you are going through right now or what you will go through. But what I do know is we're all walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And Psalm 23 says that we can walk through the valley of the shadow of death alone, by ourselves, isolated, fumbling in the dark, trying to find some source or some, some place of hope, some feeling that will relieve us. But there's only, the scriptures speak of only one source that will scatter the darkness. One person who will walk in the valley of the shadow of death and we will fear no evil. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In John chapter 8, it says this. Jesus is once again speaking about himself being the light of the world. And he said, I am the light of the world. And this is the promise to every single person here, everyone that is in this space. This is the promise. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. If you follow me, you don't have to walk in, your family does not have to walk in darkness. You do not have to walk alone because you will have the light that leads to life. And so today, we are going to be taking up our candles in a few moments. And I want you to to see this candle, every single one of us, as your life. And we have the option to have our life be a symbol of darkness and living in the darkness, or we can bring our life into contact with Jesus Christ, who will bring a newness and renewal to our soul and light us in the darkness, bring life because of what He did on the cross for you and I. And so I don't know where you are in your walk with life, but I I have three people that I want to speak to tonight as we light these candles, and I want to challenge you, these three people, in three different ways. I'm going to blow this out so I don't get wax all over my fingers as I speak. Perhaps you are here, and you realize as we're speaking about darkness and we're speaking about this idea of light being blown out, you've realized you've been living in a perpetual state of darkness. Perpetual state. You have had ESCOM load shedding for your whole life. Not once have you come in contact with the life that, the life that leads to life. I want to say to you that Jesus Christ is standing. And he says, come to me. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And so if you are here tonight, as they pass the light around, I want you to light your candle. And I want to invite you to make this a moment where you give your life to Jesus. Where you say, Jesus, I've never received your life, but I'm hearing what's being spoken. I'm hearing the gospel, and I'm, my heart is responding. I've tried everything else, but now I choose you. I choose you, Jesus. Let that be your prayer. Perhaps you're here tonight. There's a second group of people I want to speak to. And at some stage, in some, some way, you gave your life to Jesus, and you lit your lamp. But you've continued to walk. And you've continued and you found yourself turning again and again from God. And you found in your light dimming to the point of you even questioning whether you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to invite you to light your candle as a symbol of returning home. Just as light calls us from the darkness and calls us home, Jesus is calling us home. I, the picture I had is the famous picture of the prodigal son who said, Father, give me all that you have, and I'm going. I'm going. I'm leaving you. And he went out, and he tried everything the world had to offer, and he came empty. And he thought, what? maybe my dad will take me back. Maybe, just maybe, my dad will let me return back to him. And what is the story? The story tells us that he, he turns home, and his dad is ready, and he's waiting for him. Ready and waiting. Braces him and says, welcome home, my son. 
That's the invite for you tonight as you light your candle. And the third group, those of you who have been faithful, faithful Christians, you've been standing strong all these years. You've been trying your best to live your life. I, I had the picture of the prodigal son's brother standing, resentment building in their hearts as they, they get the picture of God's grace saying, Lord, I've been so faithful all these years. Why did they get it for free? Why did they get the party? And I want to say to you that God wants to invite you home as well. He wants to call you home and say, come home, my son, my daughter. And so each of you have hopefully got your light, your candle lit. We're going to go into a song now. And as that song plays, I want to encourage you to use this as a moment just to pray to the Savior. Pray to Jesus, the light of the world, the symbol that is in your hand. And say, Lord, give me the life of light. Give me the life of light. And so, Father God, I want to pray over this entire community. Lord, you know their stories, I do not. And we pray, I pray, Father God, that your light may shine into our darkness and bring us light of life. In your mighty name.
So Jesus came into the world to light a light to all who had come to him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the promise. And as I mentioned in Isaiah chapter 60, that Jerusalem was meant to be the city on a hill that could not be hidden, a light to the nations, drawing all to her, to her walls to bring provision and to bring fruitfulness and to bring flourishing. It was meant to be a gift to the world. The surprise came when it was Jesus Christ who lit a new light for all who had come to him as a baby in the manger. But here's the kicker. Matthew chapter 2, Jesus comes. He is the light of the world. But in Matthew chapter 4, uh, Matthew chapter 5 rather, he says this on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you, to his disciples, if you are here tonight and you've given your life to Jesus Christ, he says this, you, are now the city on the hill that cannot be hidden. You are the light to the world. And although it's so beautiful to have the light of life within us, what is the point of light if we hide it under a bowl? What's the point of having electricity through solar panels and aircon if we don't open up the house to all to come and experience it? <laughs> That's an invite for you to invite me to your house if you have aircon. <laughs> But it's also a challenge that says, if you have the light of Christ, then we've got to go tell it on the mountain. And so we've got the, the youth band here. By the way, they're awesome. Yeah, give them a round of applause. And I'm going to invite you to stand up with me. We're going to sing our last song. We're closing off the evening with this. And it's a song, Come, Tell It on a Mountain. And I want to use it as a challenge to you. You're wondering, what is my next step? Your next step is this, to go and tell it on the mountain, to share the light of life with all you come in contact with. Now, before I close off, I just want to say this, before I hand over to the youth band who are going to rock it. I want to say this, that tonight, perhaps God has spoken to you. It could be in a powerful way, it could be in a subtle way, but you might just be needing someone to connect with. We're going to be asking the elders and the pastors to come to the front here. And they're going to be up here for a very long time. So you can go and get coffee and you can go do your thing. And you can come to one of the elders or pastors and you can just ask them to pray for you. It could be something as simple as, I just need prayer. To I've given my life to Christ and I don't know what my next step is. Or I need prayer for my family member. It could be anything. They're here. They're here to minister to you. They're here to minister to your family. So bring a whole family if you want. But for now, we as a community are going to sing. Let's go tell it on a mountain. Right.
Now, please give them another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. It was indeed a beautiful evening, man. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, uh, before we came out here, uh, I was walking with my son to the car, and he's like, and we're going to play outside, and then we're going to have a party. And then I had to like, think twice about that, and I'm like, and you're actually right, you know, because we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, man. That's like a party. So you guys are a proper party. Thank you so much for getting involved. And I want to ask you to give yourselves a round of applause. Just before we leave, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you once again to remember the connect cards that are in your seat. Uh, please do fill them up for us and then uh, post them in. There's a red post box there to my left. Uh, please do post them in there. You can also scan the QR code as we would love to get in touch with you. And I am a member of this church and I definitely would love to see you again. And then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, also please feel free to come to the front as we do end to chat to some of our pastors um, uh, up here in front. If you also need uh, any counseling or if you need any prayer, you're more than welcome to come to the front. Or otherwise, you can also request a meet-up call uh, via the Connect card on your seat as well. And then remember, we have a church service each and every Sunday. That's at 9 a.m. Each and every Sunday at 9 a.m. And then we will not be having a service on the 24th, but we will have a Christmas Day service on the 25th. That's at 9. And there will also be another family day just like this, just like today, which was absolutely fun, and I hope we will be seeing you there. Ladies and gentlemen, it was lacquer, my nose that lar. I'm going to ask that you drive home safely, that you do so, and that you please come and visit us again if you were visiting for the first time. Take care. God bless. Thank you.